Welcome to day 295 of our DSO journey. I'm Ed Krasenstein, here with my twin brother, Brian. And we have a very special guest today, Hunter Paulson. You know him as H. Paulson on DSO, and he's made quite a name for himself. How's it going, Hunter? It's going good. How are you guys doing? Good. Great. It's awesome to have you here. Uh, I, I know you always have a lot to say, so... <laughs> Yeah, we're going to get to talking to Hunter about the upcoming fork, as well as Dow coins and perhaps smart services in a little bit. But first, we're going to touch on some of the news that took place yesterday. Remember, these videos are sponsored by NFT Tech. They are one of the investors of CloudFeed. So shout out to them. And we'll get into the news. Yesterday, Mubs announced that he's working on another project, yet another project. It seems like he's working on a million things. Him and Thorsten are always working on stuff. But his project's called D-Rarity, and it's going to aim to rank generative art and collectible NFTs by rarity on DSO. So it's a something that's cool. I think it's something that the community would love to see. So kudos to Mubs for what he's doing. Yeah, yeah I think that, I think a lot of collectors, what they're looking for in NFTs are their rarity. So it's a tool that will kind of show showcase which, which ones are rare, which ones might be more rare than other series. I, I think that's really cool. And, and I think it can add a whole, whole other dimension to the whole NFT space here. And I, I mean, not to say you can't find out the rarities through other nodes and, and whatnot, but I think having it all put together in an easy to understand way like Mumps is doing could be pretty valuable. Yeah, for sure. And Paul Burke, another developer who's developing like crazy, it seems like he's constantly working on something uh, created and announced DSO Generator. Uh, you, can, you can go there by going to dsogen.app. And it's a simple open source client side DSO wallet generator. So essentially, it lets you create a DSO wallet offline without having to use identity if, you, if you're afraid of identity or you don't want to use it for some reason. Have you checked that out yet, Hunter? Yeah, so um, I did check it out. I was actually helping him a little bit um, when he was building because I basically suggested... And Chainsurf, um, someone that was asking, like, okay, does this actually make a difference because it's still a website, even though you're not storing anything? Um, and I told him that, uh, you know, he, he should just make it what's called a progressive web app. And then you can use it. Like, if you turn your Wi-Fi off, you could still use it. Um, and then it, it, it feels more safe because it's not online anywhere. Um, so, yeah, I checked it out and I was helping a little bit out there and, and it, was, it was pretty good. Yeah, I know that like we we have a secondary account, KRA Wallet, where we store most of our valuables. And uh, to do that, we actually went and bought a new brand new laptop and only accessed these, the these Diamond app to create the account and created the account. Uh, don't access anything else from that computer. And that's kind of our, our way of security. But But I love this. This adds another layer of protection, I think. Yeah, so, so you guys have like a hardware wallet, but it's a whole machine. That's all. Yeah, exactly. It was only like a $300 laptop on Amazon. So it's That's... probably pre-hacked. The Chinese is probably <laughs> yeah. <in it. laughs> But uh, yeah, Paul Burke's doing an awesome job. I, I saw Natter replied to him. He had a, a few issues and asked him to make some changes. So it's awesome that Natter's noticing it as well. Uh, yesterday's story had some more announcements. Of course, story is the upcoming story app created by Design Star and Rebal of CloudFeed. Um, they elaborated on their idea and they're, they're utilizing NFTs in a way that we haven't seen utilized yet on DSO in the upcoming app that they're creating. So just like Instagram stories or stories on other mobile apps, you're gonna be able to create stories and share them on the DSO blockchain. You're gonna be able to create stickers, filters, and stuff like that, everything you're familiar with when you create stories. But these stickers, and filters are going to be NFTable. So artists can create different filters, different stickers, and make them into, into NFTs. And creators can even turn their stories into NFTs. And they, they said on, in a Twitter post, they said, watch as your stickers are used in thousands of stories and stack your story token throughout the journey. So, I, I mean, it sounds amazing to me. I love what they're doing. I think it's such a unique idea. I think it has a lot of potential to bring people over from Instagram to check out DSO because of the story app. Yeah, and not only are they like integrating NFTs in this unique way, unique and fun way, but they're kind of gamifying it as well. So I think there's going to be several avenues to kind of attract people here and addict them to the to the app. 
Uh, so I'm looking forward to what they're doing. They're, they're, I, I know they've been, I, I think this is kind of something that's evolving. I think that they're constantly coming up with new ideas and I don't know when it's going to be released, when it's going to actually go live, but I'm certainly going to be somebody that's going to be using it. My wife's really excited about it as well. How about you, Hunter? You don't really seem like the type yeah. of guy that would use a story type app. Dude, no, you know what? Um, I'm actually excited for, for story as a project. Um, I think that it's interesting how they sort of took the Instagram on Diso idea, which doesn't work as an idea, I don't think. And they took that and they added so much to it that now it works. Um, and look, you have um, Rival, who's an amazing engineer. I've worked with him. Um, he's, he's just so good uh, to build it. And you have uh, Designsta, who's actually like sort of doing product and um, kind of like the ideas and stuff like that. And so uh, I think it's a, a really solid team to work together and to come up with ideas that, that function and just make it good. So yeah, I, I mean, the demos that they've posted are so good. Like they're just really, really beautiful. And um, yeah, I think that will be a product that um, definitely helps the ecosystem a little bit. Yeah, and I, I sort of agree with you on your on your thought that Instagram really doesn't work on Diso. I know Brutal is going to have a problem with us for saying that because he's working on Gem Story, of course. But you know, I, I think I think to Ed, bring stop people being over, so brutal to brutal. Yeah, I'm sorry to be so brutal, brutal, but I think to bring people over to Diso, you need something that's different, not something that's just the same on Web three. Yeah, I, I agree, and I, I've said for a little while that like. We need unique products that integrate DSO, not existing products that are built on DSO, um, because people people don't people don't want to move over just for decentralization. We've seen that, so you need you need you need some push factor. Yeah, and that's something we struggle with with NFTZ. We're constantly trying to come up with ideas that can differentiate us from like an open C, because we're on DSO and because we have you know the social embedded. So we're constantly trying to work on ideas for that. Because just copying other sites, that's not really the answer to bring people over, I don't think. Exactly. But, but yesterday, uh, the DSO account disrupt the Preneur, which is uh, run by Jeremy Gardner and Sir Guy, who also runs Seals. They run that account. And they won and bid on GD Virtual Galleries NFT for a deluxe 3D virtual NFT gallery. It's a personalized gallery that's, in the Vanderbilt building in New York City. And they want it for 169 DSO, which is around $12,603 or so at the time of this video, which I think is really incredible. Uh, like I said, Disrupt the Preneur is an account by Jeremy Gardner, who's the founder of Blockchain EDU and Augur Project. He's, he's pretty big on Twitter. I think he has like 30,000 followers. Uh, it's a fund and Jeremy's running this fund with like I said, Sir Guy, who runs a SEALs DSO account. And they have a lot of big things ahead. I was talking to Sir Guy this morning. I think they're going to try and come on our show either next week or the following week to talk about some of the big things they're working on. But it's, it's great to see GDS uh, you know, sell these NFTs and sell these galleries because the work he's putting into it is phenomenal. And I, I, I love his ideas with what, with what he's doing. Yeah, I mean, he just got Octane funding and he's already bringing in quite a bit of revenue. So good for him. Uh, like I said before in a clubhouse yesterday, he's working with so many different people and reaching out to all these different project managers and working with all these other teams. He's like a great, great guy. Uh, he has great ideas and I, I can't imagine him not succeeding beyond probably his own wildest dreams. Have you had a chance to check out the virtual galleries yet, Hunter? No, I haven't. I haven't, I haven't actually heard of it. I'll have to, uh, I'll have to check it out once we're off. It's really cool. Like, so you have these virtual galleries that you can walk through and view NFTs. There's music playing in the background. Uh, I know he's working with Mercury to create one where Mercury can actually be playing music in his gallery. Uh, he wants to have avatars. So people are going to have avatars and, you know, I could walk around in this gallery and see you there and hang out with your, your avatar in the gallery. And then, NFT artists can create clothing for the avatars. And you can we can hang stuff. out with our Eagles, Eagles jerseys on. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Sounds like a yeah. good time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hunter and us were both Eagles fans. For, so we're rooting for the Eagles to tomorrow against the Tampa Bay Bucks. Uh, you know, 
I hope AB doesn't have any problems with that. I know he's no longer on the Bucks, so maybe he's on <laughs> our side now. <laughs> I forgot AB was on D, so that's so funny. <laughs> but but yeah, so so that's great. And um, yesterday, I, before we get to Hunter, I just want to mention yesterday the NFT project. There's a new NFT project called T- Tunnel Arrows. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but it's by Alendez and Sancheski. They're part of the Tunnel community, the Spanish speaking community on DSO. And, and they created this project and into the first 10 NFTs and they sold out within, within a matter of seconds. Uh, they're minting 10 more today at 2 p.m. Eastern time. The entire series is going to be 500 NFTs. It's great to see the Spanish community really embracing DSO and getting involved. And it's funny because NFTs within among English speakers are kind of in a lull right now, but they're catching fire within the Spanish community. So it's, it's great. Uh, of course, Tunel is run by Haz Rodriguez and he has a great, huge community there. Yeah. And I, their discord is like jumping. I, I mean, there's like thousands of people in their discord. And if you head over to their discord and you do speak Spanish, head into one of the voice chats. And usually there's like 20 or 30 people in there talking about DSO. So that community alone is doing a huge service to the whole ecosystem. Hopefully we see more of more communities like that pop up around maybe different languages, different geographical locations and stuff like that. Yeah. D social world doing a great job there as well, bringing the international community and people who speak other languages onto DSO. And like you were saying, the discord, I went into Tunnel discord the other day and I had, I wanted to communicate with people. So I had to use Google Translate. That was a little awkward, but I, I think I did a pretty good job. I just hope Google Translate did a good job. Hey, but Daniel, finally, I, I saw, oh yeah, go I ahead. I saw Hunter. that project, if I can pop in real quick. Yeah, um, I saw that project uh, on Chain if someone had mentioned it and I hadn't heard of it before. I feel like they kind of popped up out of nowhere and it's just massive. Like, I don't know where all these people came from or where this project came from, but I, I'm here for it. I love it. I love it so much. Yeah, it, it's awesome. And finally, I want to say, Today on the DSO Foundation Discord, I don't know if you heard about this yet, Hunter, but I think you'd be perfect for it. There's DSO debates. Uh, Darian Parrish is putting it together. DOZ, Nordian, Sandy Rose, Dillcell, Smurve, and several others are going to be taking place in head-to-head debates on four different topics. They're going to be 15 minutes per topic. Are you going to be there? Are you going to try and take part? Yeah, it wasn't my plan to be there. I did see it, though, um, on chain. Um, I think it's an interesting concept. Uh, I think it, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I'll, I'll have to see how this one goes. And then if they do it again, maybe I'll go. Um, I just don't necessarily like the idea of like, I, I don't think the topics that that were there, or, or I couldn't think of any additional topics that I thought like could be debated among community members, at least not ones that I cared about enough to spend my time debating. Yeah. Yeah, so, so that's at 2 p.m. Eastern time today. I, I mean, I think people would love to see, hear you debate, though, because, I mean, you do it all the time anyway. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'll show up. 2 p.m.? <laughs> yeah, 2 p.m. Eastern You want to show up. You want to show up and then just speak over everybody? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but so, yeah, so, yeah, so that's the news yeah, we have today. Let's get on to you, Hunter. I, I know that we've seen so much change over the last, I guess, like two or three weeks uh, with the DSO DAOs, the smart services, uh, the, this hard fork that's coming on January 24th. Uh, I, it's, it's hard to unravel it all and totally understand it all. I think that like Ed and I, we've spent so much time just reading up on everything and, and we still don't know exactly how everything will work and function when everything rolls out. Uh, what, what are your thoughts say on the DSO DAOs? I know you have an opinion on this. Yeah, for sure. So the DAO specifically, I think, are an interesting concept. Um, I, I'm actually more excited about the uh, the cryptographic functions that come with the DAOs, uh, which are multi-sig, um, auth, and uh, spending limits for derived keys. Those are going to be huge, 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 huge for developers, especially the spending the spending limit. Uh, that's going to make life for engineers who are building um, server-side applications so much easier. So I'm excited for that. Uh, in terms of the actual organization side of things, I think it'll be nice to have an asset that we can mint um, that isn't on a bonding curve. Uh, we'll have to see how that goes because I think that the bonding curve for Criticoins just didn't, it didn't work out. Uh, maybe it wasn't thought through enough, things like that, because it was done really early. You know, obviously BitCollet released accidentally, all those things. So um, uh, yeah, I'm excited for DAOs. I think that 
Um, the name is awful, but you know, whatever. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty excited for those. How about smart services? I, I know that, I know you had an opinion on those. I don't think he, it was yeah. too favorable, but uh, <laughs> I still think it's important to hear what you have to say because I think we need to hear like skepticism and and we to build a better product. That's how we do it. We have to listen to those yeah. who are critical. Yeah. So smart services. Um. I I think I think my problem with smart services aren't isn't even what they actually are. It's just like the branding. Um. The thing is, smart services make sense because um, the thing is, the core team didn't build any product. They're just basically structuring out a framework to use existing tech. They're saying, look, you're going to build what's called the REST API, which is technology that basically every developer has used for 22 years. You're going to build a basic REST API, and it's going to include these endpoints and this function. So it's really a framework or like an outline, not really any tech, which is why there was no DIP. There was no changes to the protocol level, nothing. Uh, like that, which I'm fine with. That, that makes sense for the pro type of products we have on DSO, but it's not a replacement for smart contracts. And it's not a, um, it, they're not similar in any way. It's really apples to oranges. I think instead of trying to uh, replace smart contracts, they created something new, which is fine. It's just that like the way it was marketed and branded to us was just awful. The blog post was filled with jargon. And that part was kind of frustrating because when they first announced it on the Twitter spaces, I was excited. I thought they were building, you know, something big and then we got it and it was like, well, what, what is this? Um, but with, with the, uh, the, the Dow coin proposal though, I think that it, it makes sense to do it the way they're doing it instead of having on-chain computation. Uh, so I back them on that. It's just that like the way they're, they're sort of explaining it isn't the most accurate and is kind of, kind of annoying, but Again, I, I don't really care about marketing. I care about substance. So um, at first I was a little frustrated, but now I'm cool with it. Yeah, you, you know, like I, I hear a lot of people saying they wish they didn't really market it as if it's smart services versus smart contracts. Because I think in the long run, smart services and smart contracts are going to exist side by side. Mm -hmm. I don't, I think challenging smart contracts and all these people who have been working so hard to develop smart contracts and kind of saying they're going to be obsolete because of what we're doing. I think that kind of alienates those people. And it, instead of bringing them on to DSO, it might be like, we don't want to touch DSO. You know, so, so I, I agree. I think the marketing around it could have been done a little differently. As far as what they are, it's, it's hard for me to re really think about what they are until I see them. You know, like, you know, we're told about what they are. But I think a lot of people just need to see what they do and how developers are going to use them first. Yeah, I'm really, I'm a big fan of the idea of appealing to these troves and troves of already already existent web developers out there that can just come on and, and build. And especially when you're dealing with the uh, hackathons, you don't have to like spend all this time teaching these people how to build on, uh, on a blockchain. You already have them able to do it. And that means quick innovation. Uh, I do think that there are, like Ed said, and, and like Hunter said, I think they're there will be definite definite use cases for smart contracts as well. So like, I don't think you can just say this or this, you gotta say this and this. And I, I think as we move forward, I wouldn't be surprised to see both on DSO. Um, I, I, think that, I, I, I think that smart services have a lot of potential, but I do think that you can't, you can't achieve that potential without also appealing to the crypto space and not alienating them. So I, I agree with what Ed said as well. Yeah, and, and another thing just to sort of add on the end of that is that like smart services really is like what we already have almost. Um, the, the products being built here are sort of already structured in a way where they're all web-based, they're centralized web two based apps that just use data that's on, on a decentralized blockchain, which is cool. Um, and, and that makes sense for social products. Like that that is how you do it because you can't really like these are doesn't have dApps. You can't build a decentralized app like, like it just it just doesn't work out. Um, and so it, it, it makes sense that we're doing it this way. Um, and I don't I don't think we'll see smart smart contracts on DSO. I don't think they make sense. Uh, smart contracts are slow. They're clunky. They're kind of awful, but they have their place in DeFi and they will always exist. And by almost like attacking them and saying like, look, we built a better replacement. No, you built something totally different. And now you have the whole Ethereum community mad at you. 
we already have a bad spot in crypto Twitter. So it's like, you know, I, I just don't think that was the, the right move. So I'm hoping that when they brand and market Dow coins and this, this whole fork together, if that's what they do, they, they think kind of hard about, okay, let's be strategic about how we're wording things and how we're branding things and stuff like that. So, so could you explain like what the difference between a smart service is and then compared to what these nodes are doing already? Like, for example, Mubs is doing this rarity tool for NFTs. Is that not like a smart service in a way? Yeah, so, so it kind of is. The thing is, is that uh, all, all a smart service is, is essentially one of these Web2 apps, but built specifically for um, programmatic interaction. So instead of me saying, okay, so, okay, so it would be, it would basically be an app that, you know, say, say for example, NFTZ would call and say, okay, Hunter, um, this person wants to uh, send us DSO and we're going to send him uh, back some NFT Z coin, um, a, a DAO coin. So that's, that's fine. So on client side, what your app would do is take their DSO, send it to the smart service, the smart service would process it and send them back the DAO coin, um, which is kind of already possible. It's just that like no one's, no one's doing it in that way, but it's extremely similar to still running just a regular node and attaching an API to that and letting people interact. So the, the actual like structure in terms of um, web two and web three. So centralized that built on decentralization doesn't change. It's just that the ways that we're using them, it's almost like core is making a suggestion. They're saying, look, we're suggesting that you guys process data and, and, and do actions in this way. Um, and, and here's some endpoint names and some, some examples to sort of help you do that, which is solid. And, and, I, and I'm a fan of that. I just wish they didn't brand it as a, as a replacement. So, so, so it'd be kind of like, instead of NFTZ saying, okay, we're going to do this ourselves, create this app within our site, maybe other developers will have already created a tool for that and shared it to the whole community. So anyone can use that smart service. So, so I, I think that's kind of like the difference, right? Like, you know, in, like more like open source shareable services that anybody can use on their app or website or node. No, definitely. And I think it'll be interesting to see how uh, engineers innovate because the thing is that because these are centralized, um, I, I don't know that um, you'll see a ton of cross application usage. Like maybe, you know, I have an application, I will use my own smart services, but I don't know necessarily that I'm going to say to my users, okay, we're going to use this person's smart service. You're going to send your money there. I don't know how I feel about that. Um, and so there, I think there will be innovation though, in terms of uh, being able to prove that a deployed application is the same as an open source version of that application on GitHub. Uh, there's some things that are possible with like GitHub Actions um, and, and things like that, that could make it possible to, to verify that. And that's big. That's really, really big. That is big. That's a good point. Deployment. Yeah. If you can verify deployment, then, you know, now I trust your application. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I, uh, that there's a whole different side of things because web three is about validation, not trust. Uh, so if we can do that, great. Uh, I think that'll come, but it just sort of depends on how quickly people innovate and, and, you know, kind of what we see happening. So yeah, what about that, forks? I know, I know you want to talk a little bit about the fork that's coming up. Yeah, for sure. So I'm, I'm actually really excited for this fork. Um, one of the, one of the biggest things I've been excited about on DSO probably ever. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely excited. It includes things like DAO coins. It includes things like, um, uh, uh messaging V3, uh, all kinds of stuff. I can't even think of all yeah, the NFTs 2.0, uh, messages 2.0, I think smart contracts, DAO coins, uh, and yeah, I, I think that yeah, might so be much, it. There's so much stuff. stuff, so much stuff. I, I think the, the biggest reason I'm excited is not even for the fork, but how they're handling the fork. Um, you know, they put out a timeline, huge. I love that. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of progression in this space in terms of, okay, we're getting serious about building. We're, we're fostering a serious developer ecosystem where, you know, engineers are not afraid to build here because their projects won't die just kind of randomly because that's almost what we had before, which was a little scary. Um, so look, I'm excited about the timeline. I think it's a little too short, which I think Tyne posted about as well today. Yeah. 
Um, but but look, that's all right. We'll get through it. Uh, so they were supposed to release a, a release candidate yesterday. I didn't see one, so maybe they're a little behind there, which is okay. Stuff happens. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing that, and then you know I'll upgrade my nodes, and hopefully everyone will upgrade theirs, and it should be a pretty solid transition. Yeah, and and I, I think like I'm glad that we didn't get a million active users four months ago or five months ago. I'm glad that it hasn't happened yet because I think that once we have this hard fork and once things start developing, then when these people come, they're more likely to stay. It's going to be easy to retain them. So I, I actually think it's a blessing that things have been quiet over the last six months, uh, especially as we move forward. No, and, and I've said that for a little while as well, because the thing is, is like they look, they accidentally released this product, right? We know that. Um, and so I think it's really tough when you have a ton of users at the very beginning of a product and you weren't even ready to release it. And now all those people who get a bad taste in their mouth, they're not coming back. It is really tough to get users back that didn't have a good experience. And so it makes a lot more sense to build and build and build and build and build um, rather than trying to get all these users from marketing and all these things. It just, it doesn't fit yet. You have to have a good foundation, a good product before you try to, um, to, to grow and scale because otherwise if you grow too quick, it'll just fall down. Yeah. Um, it's like the so multiplier effect, like one, one action five months ago wouldn't have snowballed. Whereas now you could, you could roll something out. People get excited. Uh, maybe developers start are already on board so they can start developing based on that change and things can like snowball and really grow. So I, I think that, I think that things are happening at the right pace right now. Whereas six, seven, eight months ago, things were just going crazy and they weren't really ready for it to happen that way. Yeah, exactly that. I, I, I'm a fan of, I'm a, I'm a fan of the stuff of, uh, sorry, of the way things are going. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of stuff pop up in Q1 in terms of changes. Uh, I just wish that like, we heard about these things as they were being built because it kind of felt like in Q4, nothing was getting done. And that that's like a scary feeling. That's uh, true. As someone... Yeah, when, when you're super active here, that's worrying, right? So uh, it would have been nice to, to have like a sort of, okay, we're working on this. And like, here's what we've done so far. Here's the progress. Uh, and it's really tough, especially with Core, because what they like to do is sort of package these changes into one pull request, into one commit. And it's like, well, that makes it tough because we can't, we can't follow what's going on in terms of source. Um, and they're getting better with it. So, you know, I, I applaud them for that. And I think they're trying this year so far, they've, they've done a solid job. So I look forward to seeing that progression because really it isn't about getting to the end goal. It's just about growing a little bit each time. Uh, every time we make a protocol change, just grow a little more and how you're doing it. And uh, I think they've done that. So I'm really excited to see how the rest of Q1 plays out, uh, especially with all these changes. Yeah. It's 2022 seems like it's going to be exciting. I want to thank you, uh, Hunter. I know we got to go. Brian has a birthday party to go to. Uh, thanks for taking part. I'm sure we'll have you on again sometime. I think uh, it's sure. interesting to talk to you. And maybe we'll see you at the debates later today. Sounds good. It sounds and good. And go Eagles. Go Eagles. Go Eagles. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> right, AB. Nice.